Happy Sunshine Family, Lunacy is back. It's been quite a while since I've had a video up. I've got a crease in my backside from sitting on the edge of my seat for over a month. We've got a little bit of movement in this matter, the Heather Ann Tucci giraffe case. Um, not a whole lot that we haven't already seen. Uh, this is still pretty much looking like C. Clifford Shirley is putting his hands over his ears, closing his eyes, and saying, la, 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 la. And Heather is standing in her truth and rejecting C. Clifford's rejection of his own common senses. <clears throat> now, as we get into this, C. Clifford is going to be the one that brings up the term common sense. And, well, I've got a few things to say about common senses. We all have senses. For me particularly, I sense light through my eyes, or at least that's the way I describe it. Sense vibrations in the air through my ears. I have a tactile sense of touch. I have a sense of smell and a sense of taste. Now those are the five senses that are thought of as common senses. But I take it even one or two steps further by adding two more senses. I add in there the stream of ideas that I call my thoughts. I, I label that as a sense now. And I label the stream of data that comes into my being that is labeled as emotions. I label that as, uh, or I, I, hmm, that's in the sense category as well. Now, thoughts and emotions, those are two areas that are not usually thought of as common senses. And what I've noticed in my own explorations of myself is, you know what? For the most part, I don't control my thoughts. I can select an area to focus on, but ultimately, I don't control what I focus my thoughts on in the now moment. Ideas just pop into my head. And the same with emotions. I don't control my emotions. I'm not my emotions. They're just a signal on my dashboard. From who? I don't know. I'm guessing Grace. So keep that in mind as we read through some of the documents that we've got. And the first one I'm going to go over it's just Randy Bean's request to join in the co-defendant filing. This is just a quick two-page document. Comes the defendant, Randall Keith Bean, through his elbow counsel and respectively, or excuse me, respectfully requests that he be allowed to join the objections filed via personal delivery to the clerk's office and stamp copied, quote, filed, end quote, on November 30th, 2017, by co-defendant Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe. The defendant is similarly situated as the co-defendant in that defendant also believes that this court has no jurisdiction over him. Wherefore, the defendant respectfully requests through his elbow counsel this honorable court to allow him to join the above-referenced filing of co-defendant Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe respectfully submitted this 30th day of November 2017 by Stephen McGrath. And then we've got the certificate of service. I hereby certify that a true and exact copy of this document has been served upon counsel for all parties of record in this case via this court's electronic filing system on this 30th day of November 2017. Now, that's really interesting because we've got a bunch of other documents that Heather looks like has responded to. This is the response from C. Clifford Shirley Jr. to Heather's Praesipe. Now, you'll remember the Praesipe is an order, 
and it's an order in this case to correct material facts and errors about the jurisdiction and authority that the court systems have. <clears throat> Heather basically has the courts in checkmate, showing that they don't have all their ducks in a row. And thus far, the court has pretended to act stupid, pretended to act confused, and has not given any statements in validation or acknowledgement uh, of Heather's position. Instead, they just keep repeating the same thing over and over again. The Constitution tells us that we have jurisdiction. The laws of the United States tell us we have jurisdiction. And Heather's hmm, statement of fact, Heather's affirmation that the United States does not exist anymore and has been duly foreclosed on. Therefore, all of these laws that C. Clifford Shirley Jr. is citing are in error. So up here at the top, Heather's got bracketed by asterisk, original instrument, Entirety, duly rejected without dishonor for due cause, lacks due verification and validation with signature and seal of presenter's identification, authority, authorization, and endorsement with an I. I wonder if that means endorsement, E. Uh, November 30th, 2017, signed Heather Antucci draft. We got a, what appears to be a thumbprint. Uh, Hat J reference. See also documents 52, 49, 55, 53, 43, 54, 18, and 48. For RKB, see documents 18, 19, 45, 50, 51, 42, and 52. So we've seen this before. Heather writing on court documents that... Uh, are generated by the court, by C. Clifford Shirley Jr. himself. And let's take a look at what he said in the matter of Randall Keith Bean and Heather Antucci Giraffe in response to the Presepe. Report and recommendation. All pretrial motions in this case have been referred to the undersigned pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 636 subsection B for disposition or report and recommendation regarding disposition by the district court as may be appropriate. So all pretrial motions in this case have been referred to the undersigned. So let's go all the way down to the last page. <clears throat> the undersigned, C. Clifford Shirley Jr. This case is before the court on defendant Tucci Giraffe's pending pro se filing entitled Presepe enter to enter dismissal with prejudice and declaration of due cause. Quote, Presepe and De declaration of facts, end quote, which is document 43. <clears throat> the Presepe to dismiss and defendant Bean's request to join and co-defendant filing, document 44. The defendant's joint filing appears to contend that the court lacks personal and subject matter jurisdiction in this case. The government responded, document 46, in opposition on October 12, 2017. The parties appeared for a hearing on these filings on October 18, 2017. Assistant U.S. Attorneys Cynthia F. Davidson and Anne Marie Svalto appeared on behalf of the government. Defendant Randall, Bean, Randall Keith Bean represented himself, <clears throat> assisted by elbow counsel, attorney Stephen G. McGrath. Defendant Heather Ann Tucci also represented herself. It isn't as interesting. He's using the word represent. And, and there's been a lot of discussion about the meanings that words have. First of all, family, all words have meaning. 
And there is a huge difference between present and represent. And represent is a word that appears to have an admission in it that you are giving jurisdiction to the court system. So it's just very interesting that there is this. It's a food fight with words. Heather keeps saying present, order, precipe. And Judge Shirley keeps saying represent and uh, jurisdiction and hearing and motion and argument. All of those words lead in to jurisdiction being uh, given to the courts. And, and this is a very interesting food fight with words that's going on, and it's continuing straight into the response that C. Clifford is giving. And the fact that this food fight of words going on here continues to exist uh, really belies the knowing and awareness that must be going on inside the court system, inside the, the minds of C. Clifford Shirley Jr., uh, probably Thomas A. Varlin. We haven't heard from him much, but he is apparently the what the the head of this court system uh, as far as C. Clifford Shirley Jr. Either that or Deborah Poplin, the clerk of courts. We're still we're still a little cloudy on exactly where the power, the structure, the authority, the jurisdiction for our courts comes from. And really, all Heather is saying is, you know what? There's some confusion. Here's what the confusion is. You're affirming that you have jurisdiction, so you need to prove it. The burden of proof is on you. And we're not getting that. This is very interesting, family. Okay, continuing. The court has considered the party's filings and arguments at the hearing in light of the Constitution of the United States, which... It doesn't exist anymore. The United States is bankrupt, and you know what? The people that purport to be running our government, they don't follow it anymore. That has been duly established, verified, and is known. So also, in light of the relevant statutes and case law, for, mo for the reasons set out below, the undersigned finds that the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Tennessee has jurisdiction over both the subject matter of this case and the persons of Randall Keith Bean and Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe. Accordingly, the court recommends that their pro se request to dismiss the case for lack of jurisdiction be denied. Okay, so here we've got a whole bunch of food fight words in here. Um, he's referring to Heather Ann Tucci and Randall Bean as persons, and they are not persons. Persons, when you look it up, if you said that you're a person, you are going to be giving them jurisdiction. Here's another food fight word. And... Also, this last sentence, accordingly, the court recommends that their pro se request. It's not a request. It's an order. So, C. Clifford Shirley is just continuing on with, with the same song and dance. So, section one, background. On July 18, 2017, the grand jury returned an indictment, document three, charging Randall Keith Bean and Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe with federal crimes. And we read through that indictment. We read through the uh, hearing that was later unsealed, and we found a slew of inconsistencies and questions leading all the way up through and including perjury and crimes committed under the color of authority. Defendant Bean stands charged with five counts of wire fraud and one count of bank fraud for the alleged scheme to purchase certificates of deposit via electronic financial transactions using funds from the Federal Reserve Bank, which funds did not belong to Bean, to liquidate the CDs immediately and to use the funds from the liquidation of the CDs to purchase a motorhome. 
and to pay personal expenses. The indictment also charges that Defendant Bean and Defendant Tucci Giraffe conspired to launder the funds from the alleged scheme. Warrants issued for the arrest of Defendants Bean and Tucci Giraffe on July 19, 2017. And you know, we found a lot of problems with these warrants. Defendant Bean was arrested in this district and brought to court from state custody on a writ of habeas corpus ad prosequendum, document 7. He made an initial appearance and was arraigned on July 27, 2017. At that time, the court appointed assistant federal defender Bobby Hudson Jr. to, re to represent defendant Bean. Attorney Hudson moved, document 20, the court to review the attorney-client relationship stating that defendant Bean no longer wanted Mr. Hudson to represent him and instead wanted to represent himself. The parties appeared for a hearing on the motion on August 29, 2017. At that time, the court advised Defendant Bean of the risks and perils of self-representation. And, and really, it's self-presentation. You don't re-present yourself, you present it. The only, only someone who is not yourself can re-present you. So if you're saying, I represent myself, then you're giving them jurisdiction under the, this fraud, the birth certificate fraud, this death at sea. Using the questions provided in the U.S. v. McDowell, <clears throat> 814 F 3D 245 and 251, the Sixth Circuit in 1987, those questions are what the judge used to advise defendant being of those perils. The undersigned found, or C. Clifford found, document 37, that defendant Bean knowingly and voluntarily waived his right to counsel and permitted defendant Bean to represent himself. At defendant Bean's request, the court subsequently appointed, in document 41, elbow counsel to assist defendant Bean. Defendant Tucci Giraffe was arrested in Washington, D.C. on July 26, 2017. She had an initial appearance before U.S. Magistrate Judge Deborah A. Robinson of the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. And we went through that transcript, and we got a lot of problems with that transcript as well. It's interesting how many times C. Clifford Shirley is referring to documents and hearings along this case that all of us can see problems with, that he's using them for support. Judge Robinson ruled that the individual before her was Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe and committed the defendant to the district, excuse me, to this district, meaning the Eastern District of Tennessee. On August 24, 2017, defendant Tucci Giraffe appeared before U.S. Magistrate Judge H. Bruce Guyton for her arraignment in this district. At that hearing, defendant challenged the jurisdiction of the court over her person, she never claimed to be a person and requested a hearing on jurisdiction and a detention hearing. Defendant Tucci Giraffe appeared before the undersigned for a detention hearing on August 29, 2017. At that hearing, the undersigned released defendant Tucci Giraffe on an order setting conditions of release. See, the judge knows the difference between an order and a request and a motion. He's using them properly here when he's describing them for his side, but he doesn't when he's describing them for Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe's side. And yet, he has common senses. At least he's referring to all of this. How is he gonna how is he gonna understand all of this unless he can see, can hear, has access to common sense? So the court advised Defendant Tucci Giraffe of the risks and perils of self-representation using the McDowell Litany. The court determined in Document 37 that Defendant Tucci Giraffe knowingly and voluntarily waived her right to counsel, permitted her to represent herself, and appointed Attorney Francis L. Lloyd Jr. to be her elbow counsel. At the detention hearing, Defendant Tucci Giraffe again 
sought to challenge the court's jurisdiction over her. The court informed defendant that she could raise her jurisdictional challenge in a motion, which the court would hear on October 18th. So he, he wants it to be a motion, but a precipe was filed. So section two, the position of the parties. In the precipe to dismiss, document 43, the defendants state that the United States, the prosecutors, the judges in this district, the clerk of courts, the FBI agent, the grand jury four person, and the victim banks have no authority or jurisdiction over them. They assert that the party claiming jurisdiction has the burden of proving jurisdiction exists and that the sworn declaration stands as law if it is not specifically rebutted. As a part of their precipe to dismiss, the defendants provide a, quote, declaration of facts, end quote, consisting of 55 pages of UCC financing statement amendments and addenda. The precipe to dismiss concludes by stating that defendant Tucci Giraffe, and presumably also defendant Bean, who has joined in this filing, does not consent to any individual having jurisdiction or authority over her, and I'm going to put him for Bean. The government responds in document 46 that the court has subject matter jurisdiction in this case pursuant to uh, Title 18 U.S.C. Section 3231, which gives the court exclusive jurisdiction over crimes against the United States. But you know what? See, Clifford, the United States don't exist anymore. The government argues that the defendants are charged with crimes against the United States. The government also contends that the court has personal jurisdiction over the defendants. It maintains that federal courts have uniformly rejected arguments that a defendant is sovereign and beyond the jurisdiction of the courts. Guess what? You're calling her a defendant. She's not a defendant. She has not accepted that label. And... The United States doesn't exist, according to the documents the, that's been duly foreclosed on C. Clifford Shirley. So how can you keep pointing back when we say the U.S. doesn't exist? You say the Constitution says that I have jurisdiction and authority. But the Constitution, that's part of the U.S. corporation, C. Clifford Shirley. I'm really wondering just how common your senses are. You got me scratching my head a lot. At the bottoms of all these pages, we've got <clears throat> original instrument bracketed with asterisk and duly rejected without dishonor for due cause on November 30th, 2017 by Heather Antucci Giraffe. So continuing C. Clifford's response here, both defendants filed several other, mo several other documents after the government's response. One, a due cancellation of true bill document 42 filed by defendant Bean on the 26th of September 2017. Two, a notice of filing of request for due identification and verification of authority and jurisdiction document 45 by defendant Bean filed on October 2nd. Notice of filing of original instrument canceled true bill, document 48, filed by defendant Tucci Giraffe on October 13th. Notice of filing of original instrument rejected without dishonor, documents 49 and 50, duplicate, filed by defendant Tucci Giraffe on October 13th, 2017. In each one of these bullet points, he's talking about Bean or Heather being defendant. Um, and neither one of them has has accepted that yet. Uh, notice of filing of original instrument rejected without dishonor, document 51, filed by defendant Bean on October 16th, uh, 2017. We got some footnotes here. And you know, these footnotes are just a way to really hide a bunch of legalese that might not get read inside a little number and we'll make it tiny and make it superscript. So let's see what's going on here. So for number three, which is this due cancellation of true bill, this document appears to be a supplement to defendant Bean's notice of filing of due declaration of addendum of law, presumption, perpetuity, cancellation of true bill, document 19, which was filed on August 11, 2017. 
I don't know if it is a continuation or a supplement, but C. Clifford in a footnote is labeling that document as a supplement. I wonder if that's important. Well, let's see. So footnote number four, the request for due identification and verification. So defendant Bean sent this document via certified mail to Chief United States District Judge Thomas A. Varlin, and it was docketed as a notice on October 12, 2014. The undersigned also received a copy of this document via certified mail. Interesting. All right, so footnote number five. This is the notice of filing of original instrument canceled true bill. This is a copy of the indictment with, quote, void, end quote, handwritten across each page and bearing handwritten notes by defendant Tucci Giraffe purporting to cancel the indictment. So footnote number six <clears throat> is referencing the notice of filing of original instrument rejected without dishonor. This is a copy of the government's response with handwritten notations by defendant Tucci Giraffe rejecting the response for lack of verification and authorization by the presenter. Okay, the notice of filing of original instrument canceled true bill. We're going to read about footnote 7 here. This is a copy of the indictment with, quote, void, end quote, handwritten across each page and bearing handwritten notes by defendant Bean purporting to cancel the indictment. And then the uh, notice of filing of original instrument rejected without dishonor, document 51. So footnote 8 is this is a copy of the government's response with handwritten notations by defendant Bean rejecting the response for lack of verification and authorization by the presenter. All righty, well, seven here, notice of filing of order. We got a final due notice, the price of pay. Number nine is the declaration and statement of assessments, reconciliations, and settlements credited to defendant. I think that's the, the quad, what, the $44 quadrillion one. Notice of correction of price of pay and the notice of original instrument. And each of these has footnotes uh, with them as well. So let's check out the footnotes first. All right, so the order, this is a copy of Chief Judge Varlin's referral order with handwritten notes by defendant Tucci Giraffe rejecting it. So the final due notice price of pay. This document states that the price of pay to dismiss is not a motion and directs Judge Chief Judge Varlin and the undersigned, which is C. Clifford Shirley Jr., to enter an attached order, which is signed by the defendant, Tucci Giraffe, and purports to dismiss the case with prejudice to vacate all detention orders and to close the case. So the Declaration of Statements of Assessments is the document that's footnoted next. In this document, Defendant Tucci Giraffe claims that she is owed $46 quintillion payable in pre-1933 gold and silver coins. So that was that document. Uh, the Notice of Correction of Price of Pay for footnote 12. Herein, Defendant Tucci Giraffe states that documents 18, 25, 43, 48, 49, 52, 54, 55, and, quote, the DAR from hearing on 8, 24, 17, end quote, are unrebuttable and accepted. Okay, notice of original instrument for document 57. The footnote pertaining to that is this is a copy of the arrest warrant with, quote, void, end quote, handwritten across each page and bearing defendant Bean's handwritten notes purporting to cancel the arrest warrant. All right, now, now we got to go back and, and we're going to read the actual verbiage that's not hidden in footnotes now. At the October 18th motion hearing, it's not a motion, C. Clifford, defendant Tucci Giraffe argued, no, it was not an argument, she's affirming, 
again, this food fight with words. Among other things, that the United States is a corporation, this is true, verifiable, and unrebuttable, which she has foreclosed. Well, she's got the paperwork. That the courts are functional equivalents of the banks. Yeah, that was a very interesting new one to me, but I get that. She appears to have proof in a paper trail showing that. That the judges are bank tellers. Yeah, that was a new one for me too. Maybe that's a new one for C. Clifford. Uh, but again, she appears to have supporting evidence of this. And that the Federal Reserve and Morgan Stanley amortize all indictments. She didn't say amortize. The word amortize has never been given. It was monetize. Amortization. That's an interesting word. Amortization is uh, a schedule in which you break down uh, a loan amount into principal and interest and have varying amounts of principal and interest be due throughout the course of the loan so that you have one size payment, but across all your payments, a different percentage is taken out to put towards principal and a different percentage is put towards the interest. So when you start paying off your loan, you're paying mostly interest and just a couple drops to go towards principal. And as your principal slowly reduces, the amount of interest that you're paying on each payment reduces. So you are knocking off more and more principal with each subsequent payment than you did in the previous payment. And the way they come up with that schedule is to make what is called an amortization table. It's just a big spreadsheet. I'm sure a lot of you have seen something similar to this if you've ever gotten a loan. And you've seen, uh, you know, maybe you've gotten a coupon book that gives you five years worth of coupons that you have to rip one out and send in with your payment each month. Uh, that's the product of an amortization table. So I, I don't know why C. Clifford Shirley is using the word amortize here. Uh, I believe that monetize would be a more fitting word to put in right there. But it appears that nobody really has, as far as part of the court system goes, has a clear overall big picture of what the courts are, how they came about, what their purpose is, what's keeping them going, and what their true jurisdiction, authority, and purpose is all about. And that's the light that's going to come forth from watching Heather Antucci Giraffe and Randall Keith Bean. So continuing here, Defendant Tucci Giraffe asserted that she filed a UCC financing statement which resulted in a perfected judgment against the United States. She claimed that she has also foreclosed on all domestic financial institutions along with various international banks and financial institutions. Defendant Tucci Giraffe stated that she had filed a proposed order, document 54, which she signed dismissing the case. At the hearing, Defendant Bean joined in Defendant Tucci Giraffe's filings. However, he could not explain the pay to dismiss or his legal basis for claiming that the court had no jurisdiction over him. Remember, we talked about this particular aspect when Judge Cliff C. Clifford Shirley Jr. was asking Randy. He was probing Randy for information, not that he didn't have that information. He was just probing Randy to see if Randy understood the arguments. And this is an aspect of our court systems that really fails to serve people in a high vibrational and above board manner. When, when you're asking questions of a defendant to gauge their level of understanding within the system, and then you are, you're not going to, you're not going to correct them or allow them to, to come up with, with a new understanding or to hold on to a truth that Heather has the understanding of, um, 
and and yet you're just going to railroad them through with the same old song and dance just because they don't understand it. Well, I got news for you, C. Clifford Shirley Jr. There isn't anyone in this world who truly understands the way the court systems work as far as the, the common man. And even, I, I guess I wouldn't put judges in, in the same category as common man, but they're low enough down on the whole hierarchy of the power structure that the judges might as well be commoners as well. They've been held in the darkness. There's a whole lot of darkness around here. Absence of ideas and absence of the ideas that lead to jurisdiction, authority, and ultimately the the divine rightness or wrongness for their particular actions. Assistant U.S. Attorney Svalto argued that Title 18 U.S.C. Section 3231 gives the court subject matter jurisdiction in this case. She stated that the charges give the court jurisdiction over the defendants. Assistant U.S. Attorney Svalto maintained that the defendants did not have to consent to the court's jurisdiction for the case to proceed, and in fact, the defendants were both brought before the court without their consent by means of an arrest warrant which we've got a lot of problems with both of those arrest warrants because they're based on the indictment, uh, the grand jury testimony, the transcripts, which we've got just, we've got a trail of evidence that, that just has problems all the way through from the very word go here. She stated that the UCC filings submitted by the defendants have no legal relevance or consequence and that they do not constitute a valid or enforceable judgment. And Assistant U.S. Attorney Svalto argued that many circuits, including the Sixth Circuit and the U.S. v. Pryor, 842F3D441, the Sixth Circuit 2016, which is binding on this court, have held that federal courts have subject matter and in personam jurisdiction over individuals who claim to be sovereign citizens. Well, guess what? We've already covered that sovereign and citizen are put together oxymorons that sovereign, you have to be the only ruler over a particular class of beings. It's got reign, R-E-I-N, right in the word. And so here we've got more, f more food fighting with words. C. Clifford's throwing all the words that give him jurisdiction, all the labels, sovereign, citizen, person, argument, all of that stuff, motion. And so far, none of that food fight words are sticking to Heather or Randy, but he keeps trying awfully hard. And that makes me wonder just how much he really truly knows about the true nature of our court systems. Both Tucci Giraffe, excuse me, both defendant Tucci Giraffe and defendant Bean denied that they are sovereign citizens. Defendant Tucci Giraffe stated that she is not a citizen of a, quote, corporation operating under the guise of government, end quote, and that she is not a, quote, constitutionalist, end quote, because the Constitution is a contract to which she was not a party or a signatory. See document 61, uh, trans, page 88. Instead, she maintained that the Constitution, like the United States and the United States Code, no longer exists legally due to her foreclosure. Moreover, she argued that she did not consent to this court's jurisdiction because the court had not proven its authority by providing the verification of the U.S. Attorney Jeff Sessions bearing his biometric seal, i.e. his fingerprint. Well, he's oversimplifying that a little bit. He's taking some aspects of what Heather would require and saying, oh, this is exactly what she would require but he's simplifying it way too much. Oh, and we're going to get to section three here, his analysis. What happened? Okay. Our Constitution requires that, quote, <clears throat> 
No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment by grand jury, end quote. U.S. Constitution amend, <clears throat> amendment, what, five? The instant defendants have... U.S. Const Amend 5, the instant defendants have filed in excess, the instant defendants, instant, the instant defendants have filed in excess of 725 pages, many of which are duplicates. These filings are mainly comprised of UCC financing statements and are largely devoid of intelligible argument. However, based upon the defendant's statements at the hearings on August 24th and 29th and defendant Tucci Giraffe's argument on October 18th, the court gathers that the defendants contend this case should be dismissed because the court lacks jurisdiction over them or this case. For the reasons stated herein, the court finds no basis for the dismissal of the indictment or the case as a whole and recommends that the precipate to dismiss and all the defendant's filings to the extent that they can be taken into the request relief from the court be denied. I don't know what instant defendants are. It, <clears throat> it's like breakfast drink powder or something. Just add water. Instant defendants. Hmm. But anyways, he's just recommending he's got that word in all caps and bold. So he is not, <clears throat> his decision is not anything that's binding. He is just recommending and he is making damn sure that everyone knows that he's not ordering anything here. That's a, this right here. Recommend. All caps, all bold. <clears throat> A, this court has jurisdiction over the charges and the defendants. Article 3, Section 1 of the United States Constitution. Again, he's citing a, an obsolete document that no longer exists, both effectively and through foreclosure. The United States... Court systems certainly are not upholding the Constitution anymore. They give it a lot of lip service and a lot of shows like Law and Order or CSI. But those shows, I have come to find for myself, are merely propaganda so that all of us are confused about the true nature and operations of our court system. So I think if you're watching any cop shows or Law and Order shows on television through Hollywood... You are doing your own self a disservice. That's where so much of the confusion stems from. It's from that reservoir of garbage that's called Hollywood. Article 3, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution provides in pertinent part that the, quote, judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish, end quote. U.S. Constitution Article 3, Section 1, Section 2 explains that the, quote, judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution and the laws of the United States. U.S. Constitution Article 3, Section 2, Chapter 1.1, by statute, Congress has declared that the, quote, district courts of the United States shall have original jurisdiction exclusive of the courts of the United States of all offenses against the laws of the United States, 18 U.S.C. 3231. Moreover, quote, any offense against the United States begun in one district and completed in another or committed in more than one district may be inquired of and prosecuted in any district in which such, such offense was begun, continued, or completed. Title 18, USC, Section 3237, Subsection A. The defendants are charged with wire fraud, bank fraud, and money laundering allegedly occurring in the Eastern District of Tennessee. 
Because the defendants are charged with violations of federal law, i.e., 18 U.S.C. sections 1343, 1344, 1956, and in this district, the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Tennessee unquestionably has jurisdiction over this case. See U.S. v. Pryor 842F3D441,448, the Sixth Circuit, 2016, holding the fact that the defendant was charged under federal statute provide the court quote, with federal question subject matter jurisdiction, end quote. Defendant Bean was taken into custody on an arrest warrant and brought into federal custody on a writ of habeas corpus ad prosequendum. Defendant Tucci Giraffe was brought before the court on a federal arrest warrant. Our appellate court has held that, quote, federal courts have personal jurisdiction over criminal defendants before them whether or not they are forcibly brought into court, end quote. Citing Pryor again. Also citing U.S. v. Alvarez Machain and Frisbee v. Collins. Accordingly, this court has in personam jurisdiction over the defendants. <clears throat> again, all I... Heather's saying the U.S. corporation is no longer existent. Everything so far that C. Clifford Shirley has pointed at is part of or a product of the defunct United States. B. The defendant's claims have no legal support and defy common sense. <clears throat> well, there's where Judge Shirley brings in common sense. The defendant's claims fall into three main categories. One, the United States government, including the judicial branch, no longer exists because it was a corporation which was foreclosed by defendant Tucci Giraffe and others acting on behalf of the public trust. Okay, what, how does that defy common sense? She's got all the documents to that. You can open your eyes and see them. How does that defy common sense, Judge Shirley? <clears throat> Two, various UCC financing statement amendments created and filed by Defendant Tucci Giraffe and others constitute a, quote, judgment against the United States government. Well, they do. And three, as a result of this foreclosure and judgment, the only authority over the defendants is that to which they consent. The principal idea undergirding the defendant's arguments is that an unrebutted declaration has the force of law. The court briefly examines each of the defendant's claims and find they have no basis in law or fact. <clears throat> yeah, you belie yourself here. Briefly, you have not given due diligence. There is nothing to be brief about any of this except to... Uh, continue the deception and to railroad Heather and Randy by further pursuing this matter when it's been clearly shown that you lack jurisdiction and that she has unrebutted, unrebuttable, verified documents showing the non-existence and the foreclosure of the United States Corporation, period. The defendants claim that <clears throat> the United States is a corporation based upon 28 U.S.C. section 3002, subsection 15. This statute only defines certain terms as used in the Federal Debt Collection Procedures Act. Subsection 15 defines the United States, quote-unquote, as when used in the Federal Debt Collection Procedures Act as including a, a federal corporation, B, an agency, department, commission, board, or other entity of the United States, or C, an instrumentality of the United States. Okay. Thus, even within the act, the United States is not transformed into a corporation nor limited to being a corporation, as the defendant suggests. This is... 
This is interesting. But includes any agency or department of the United States government. Moreover, the act itself states that it prohibits, quote, the exclusive civil procedures for the United States, end quote, to, quote, recover a judgment or a debt, end quote, or to, quote, obtain before judgment on a claim for a debt, a remedy in connection with such a claim, end quote. 28 U.S.C. section 3001, emphasis added. I'm guessing that's the italics. In other words, the act does not purport to define the term United States, you know, quote, United States, end quote, for any purpose other than the collection of federal debts. The statute raised by the defendants, 28 U.S.C. 3002, subsection 15, does not in any way apply to this apply in this case and has no effect on this court's jurisdiction in this criminal case. So what he's done is gone to 28 U.S.C. 3002, subsection 15, and got some verbiage out of it. One of those verbiages state, moreover, the act itself states that it provides, quote, the exclusive civil procedures for the United States to recover a judgment or debt. So he's claiming that this is a criminal procedure and that the section that Heather and Randy cited, <clears throat> that's about civil procedures, so it doesn't apply. Very convenient. What's this? Uh, uh, all right, Federal Corporation has a footnote of 14. The Corporation for Federal Broadcasting, the National Railroad Passenger Corporation, Amtrak, and the Tennessee Valley Authority are just a few examples of federal corporations. <clears throat> okay. The court characterizes Harris's argument as, quote, frivolous, end quote, observing that, quote, <clears throat> in short, the United States of America has a legal authority to bring and prosecute the superseding indictment against defendant Harris, end quote. Defendant Tucci Giraffes and Defendant Bean's assertion or declaration, quote unquote, that the United States is a corporation is also frivolous. The defendants also contend that the myriad UCC financing statement amendments that they have included with their filing constitutes a, quote, perfected judgment, end quote, against the United States that somehow prevents the defendant's prosecution for federal crimes. And we got a footnote of 15, which is a little bit long. We'll read that in a sec. To the contrary, the defendant's numerous UCC filings have no relevance whatsoever in this criminal case. You know, he's just making a blanket statement right there after admitting that he only briefly, the court briefly examines each of the defendant's claims, just, just briefly and finds that they have no basis in law or fact. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time, but we're going to find that they have no basis in law or fact. And so Defendant Tucci Giraffe and Defendant Bean's assertion or declaration that the United States as a corporation is also frivolous. And that their filings constitute a perfected judgment against the United States that somehow prevents the defendant's prosecution from federal crimes. To the contrary, the defendant's numerous UCC filings have no relevance whatsoever in this criminal case. So he's highlighting the fact that it's criminal, it's not civil. And again, he's just doing a food fight with words while he's covering his ears, closing his eyes and saying, la, la, la. Basically, he's saying, no, I have jurisdiction. No, I have jurisdiction. Let's see what this footnote is. The defendants apparently do not espouse the definition of, quote, judgment, end quote, from the same Federal Debt Collection Procedures Act from which they pluck the definition of, quote, United States, end quote. In the Federal Debt Collection Procedures Act, quote, judgment, end quote, means a judgment, order, or decree entered in favor of the United States in a court and arising from a civil or criminal proceeding regarding a debt. 
Title 28 U.S.C. Section 3002, Subsection 8, Emphasis Added. And the emphasis added is in a court. <clears throat> so a judgment means a judgment, order, or decree entered in favor of the United States in a court. So there's two things that have to happen here. First, the judgment has to be in favor of the United States Corporation in order for it to be called a judgment. And secondly, it has to happen in a court arising from a civil or criminal proceeding. So they are fighting here over the definitions of words. Family, words have meaning. And all of this back and forth between C. Clifford Shirley Jr. and Heather Ann Tucci Giraffe is fighting about the meanings of the words contained within these court proceedings. You know, we talked about this before. This is a huge substandard facet of our language that we can have words that are spelled the same, words that sound the same, that have different meanings, and we're just supposed to flow with it and know from the context what it is. That's crap. This is exactly how the game has been mechanized against us. And it is through this confusion of our language using two different languages that appear to be the same. We've got our common everyday English that, that we use to get through most of our day. And then we've got legalese. And it uses the same spellings and the same words but has different definitions. And how is it possible at all for there to be a fair trial when you're using one language and the two sides of it each have different definitions for those same words? And that that discrepancy was intentionally engineered into our court systems appears to be abundantly apparent. Okay. This is but one example of the numerous internal consistencies in the defendant's arguments. This example illustrates how the defendants pick and choose various snippets of law, the very law they claim no longer exists, and then misapply those fragments to, to try to shore up their fantastical legal theory. You know, one thing about gaslighting, and, and this is this last sentence here, this is all about gaslighting. Huh. One of the most insidious gaslighting techniques is to accuse the person who you are gaslighting of doing exactly what it is that you are doing. And in this case, what C. Clifford Shirley Jr. is doing, let me read this, let me read, reread this. I'm going to modify this a little bit, but this is really what's going on is this example illustrates how C. Clifford Shirley Jr. and the entire court systems pick and choose various snippets of law, the very law which has been shown to them no longer exists, and then watch as they misapply those fragments to try to shore up their fantastical legal theory about the authority and jurisdiction that the courts truly have. But you see, he knows this is exactly what he's doing, so he's going to try to put this label of behavior and have it stick to Randy and Heather. But yet, he is the one who has perpetrated this, this dynamic the most. Commercial code is not a law and has no legal force or effect in and of itself, but instead is a proposed model code developed to promote uniformity and commercial transactions in the various states. Each state adopts its own commercial code. The defendant's UCC filings that are part of the precipe to dismiss state that they were filed and recorded in Washington, D.C., the defendants argue that their filings include language that makes these filings applicable in all jurisdictions. However, as discussed at the motion hearing, the defendants' bare assertion of a fact or premise does not make it true. The defendants have provided no authority for their contention that they can file a UCC financing statement amendment in Washington, D.C. and somehow divest every federal court nationwide of their ability to prosecute them for federal crimes. 
Second, the defendant's filings are sham UCC financing statement amendments, wherein defendant Tucci Giraffe purports to amend a UCC financing statement, but references no current record to be amended or supplemented. The sham UCC financing statement amendments do not allege a bona fide financial transaction, but instead contain a, quote, declaration of facts, end quote, made up by defendant Tucci Giraffe and others. The fact that defendants were able to state their worldview on UCC financing statement amendment forms and have them filed by Washington, D.C. Recorder of Deeds does not shield the defendants from indictment, prosecution, or liability in this federal criminal case. C. Harris, 2009, I don't know what WL means, 1068-1132, asterisk 3. In Harris, the defendant filed a UCC financing statement and, quote, security agreement, end quote, in support of his claim that the court lacked jurisdiction over him. The court rejected the defendant's, quote, ploy, end quote. Just because Harris unilaterally chooses to call something a commercial transaction or a UCC financing statement and security agreement does not necessarily make it so, and just because Harris was able to file or record the sham UCC financing statement and security agreement with the Michigan Secretary of State does not necessarily make the documents legally valid and enforceable under the Michigan UCC. The Office of the Michigan Secretary of State merely accepted for filing documents submitted to it. The mere act of filing or recording the sham UCC financing statement and security agreement with the Michigan Secretary of State Office does not automatically make the documents legally valid and enforceable under Michigan UCC. The bottom line is that defendant James Devin Harris, a.k.a. James Devin Harris, Dash L cannot avoid indictment, prosecution, and liability in this federal criminal case based on his sham UCC financing statements and security agreements. It's interesting how C. Clifford Shirley Jr. is calling the financing statements, all the UCC paperwork, sham. You know, sham basically means fraudulent, made up. Uh, no, no authority, no standing. And how can he say that they're a sham if he only briefly considered? We'll go back up to that page. The court briefly examines each of the defendant's claims. Only briefly, because we don't want to get in and see the real light here. So we're going to label all of this UCC financing paperwork, all of the foreclosures, all of that stuff. It's a sham. Oh, hey, guess what? There's another court case out of Michigan where, where somebody used sham UCC statements and tried to get out of jurisdiction. So let's label Heather and Randy's UCC paperwork. Let's label all of that a sham. Let's not give it any weight. And that's all he's saying here. But yet all of this is just a recommendation in all caps, all bold, because C. Clifford Shirley Jr., he's not about to fire any real shots from this unsupported uh, position here. He's going to have Thomas A. Varlin do that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Likewise, defendants Tucci, Giraffe, and Bean gain no traction with their jurisdiction argument by making declarations on UCC financing statement amendment forms. So basically, C. Clifford Shirley Jr. is saying, if it's got UCC on it, I don't want to see it. It doesn't have anything to do with my court, period. But yet, his court is a business, it is a corporation, and it is bound through the UCC. Finally, the defendant's UCC filings do not constitute a lawful judgment. At the October 18th motion hearing, defendant Tucci Giraffe argued that her declaration of facts, which was stated on UCC financing statement amendment forms, constituted a perfected judgment, quote unquote. She contends that this, quote, judgment, end quote, is binding on the court because she alleged these facts and no one has rebutted them. 
She claims, as one of her ten maxims of law, that a duly sworn, verified, and validated declaration made with due signature and seal, duly unrebutted, specifically and particularly stands as law. At the motion hearing, defendant Tucci Giraffe could provide no legal authority for this maxim and could only assert that it is universally known. Well, this is interesting that, uh, that he's going to play this uh, common sense thing and shut off his own eyes and ears around the maxims of law. As defendant Tucci Giraffe, who is formerly a licensed attorney, well knows a, quote, judgment, end quote, is, quote, the official and authentic decision of a court of justice upon the respective rights and claims of the parties to an action or suit therein litigated and submitted to its determination. Black's Law Dictionary, 977, 4th edition, 1968. Providing that, quote, in judgment of conviction, the court must set forth a plea, the jury verdict or court findings, the adjudication, and the sentence, and must sign the judgment, and the clerk must enter it. A UCC filing, even a legitimate one, is not a judgment. The defendants argue that as a result of their alleged, quote, foreclosure, end quote, and, quote, judgment, end quote, both of which had been discounted above, the only authority over them is, to, is that to which they consent. The defendants contend that they do not give this court jurisdiction over them and demand that the court file their proposed order dismissing the case. While the defendants deny that they are, quote, sovereign citizens, end quote, they assert that the typical argument of those espousing sovereign citizens' views which is that the defendant is sovereign and above law. Uh, I don't think he knows the meaning of the word sovereign here. Here the defendants argument that they are, argue that they are not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States courts because they have not consented to the court's authority over them and that indictments may only be issued by the individual who is charged therein. Although the instant defendants wrap their arguments in the novel package of the One People's Public Trust, the defendant's assertions are, in essence, the time-worn sovereign citizen arguments that have been uniformly rejected by the federal courts for decades. No, they're not. C. Clifford Shirley Jr. is trying to force this monster to fit through the same cookie cutter that has worked before, and it's not happening very smoothly. That's very abundantly clear. See the United States v. Benneby from the Seventh Circuit Court, 2011, rejecting criminal defendants' argument that as a sovereign citizens and, quote, secured party creditors, end quote, they are not subject to the court's jurisdiction and collecting cases. U.S. v. Munt from the Sixth Circuit in 1994. Rejecting defendants' argument that the court lacked jurisdiction over him because he was a resident of Michigan and not any federal zone, quote-unquote, completely without merit and patently frivolous. Let's take a look at this footnote here. Let's go up and find, okay, it's to this sentence here. The defendants contend that they do not give this court jurisdiction over them and demand the court file their proposed order dismissing the case. And there's a footnote 16. At the motion hearing, defendant Tucci Giraffe argued that an indictment can only be issued by consent. She claimed this applies to her and all other people. Her incredible and absurd argument is that no criminal charges can be brought against her or anyone without the, that individual's consent. Under her reasoning, anyone can commit any criminal act, burglary, robbery, assault, drug trafficking, or even murder, but cannot be prosecuted unless they consent to being prosecuted. Even the least educated among us would scoff at this notion. You know what? I'm one of the most educated among you, C. Clifford Shirley, and I don't scoff at this. I am scoffing at your apparent inability to grok Heather's argument and to then use your eyes and see for yourself that she's got a pretty strong position. This statement here that, that you put is just patently untrue. Even the least educated among us would scoff at this notion. 
What's your support for that? What's your case study? How many people did you check? You didn't ask me. I'm not scoffing, and I have a master's degree. This sentence has no place in a legal document right here, footnote, or anywhere else. However, those intent upon preying on others would relish such a proposition. And you know what? The only person preying on anyone are the court systems and the power structure. I'm going to take a little aside here and tell you all about prey and predation. If you go back and look at my first video in the Self-Author Your Own Perception series, everything starts with a direct observation. <clears throat> we have to collect all these direct observations and then we write ourselves a little story in our head, a narrative that co connects <clears throat> and explains all these direct observations. And that narrative is our view of reality. And if we have been deceived about a particular facet of reality, then we can be taken advantage of. Our behavior can be controlled and our soul energy extracted. And from the outside, it looks like we're choosing to do it. And the only way this happens is through predation. So what does it mean to predate? Well, let's take a look at that word, P-R-E-D-A-T-E. -E. Pre, before, date. Date is a, as a point in time. So if you were before this point in time, then you have made all these observations. You have access to more facets of reality that you can write a narrative about. And if you've written a more accurate narrative and then you have deceived others because of your platform of knowing the truth before, you knew the truth on a date before others, you predate them. And when you predate them through behavior that continues to sequester the light from the people and continues to harvest their spiritual and soul energy, then you are a predator. And that's exactly what the court systems are doing here. They are predating and they are refusing to give out the light to everybody to bring everyone onto the same page. Such a system would be untenable and no nation, country, or state, or community could exist under such preposterous proposition. Where's your support for that? You've got no idea. Absolutely no idea, no way to support this. That is the, that's the hidden illusion right there. That is the propaganda that they want everyone to believe that if we don't have our system, that the situation would be preposterous, untenable, unholdable. That's what that means. Well, guess what? The system that we're battling against here has only been around in our country for 200 something years, and it's already proven to be untenable. So let's see how long you can hold on. Thomas Varlin and C. Clifford Shirley as the light continues to break away the true status of our courts. The jurisdiction of this court is provided by statute 18 USC section 3231 and the defendants were brought before the court through valid legal process. You know, I've got a problem with that because that indictment transcript and the warrants that issued off of that are anything but a valid legal process. We've proved that by reading them. No UCC filing, special oath, or phrasing, or amount of legalese by the defendant serves to divest the court of its jurisdiction. The court finds that the defendant's contention that this court must dismiss the case due to lack of jurisdiction should be denied. Conclusion. After carefully considering the parties' filings and arguments and the relevant legal authorities, 
the court finds no basis to dismiss the indictment. So he did it carefully, but way back up here, it was just briefly. The court briefly, they just briefly examines each of the defendant's claims and finds that they have no basis in law or fact. That's on page 10. But when we get down here, page 19, after carefully considering the party's filings. What, carefully and briefly, those two don't compute in my head. The, which is it, C. Clifford? So it finds that there's no basis for dismissal, to dismiss the indictment. For the reasons set forth herein, the undersign again, all caps, all bold, recommends that the defendant's filing requested the dismissal of the case, document 43, be denied. The undersign also recommends that the defendant's supplemental filings, documents 42, 45, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, and 57, which purport to void the indictment and other parts of the record also be denied. And there's no surprise that, that that's what his position was going to be. We got the certificate of service here. Okay. And all throughout, Heather and Randy have duly rejected it. So we got a food fight with words still going on. Uh, C. Clifford Shirley Jr. is uh, digging in, and he's, he's actually passing the buck. He's saying, nope, Anne-Marie Svalto said this. The Sixth and Seventh Circuit Court said this. Here's the sections of the United States law, and we have jurisdiction, but I'm not going to be the one to put my name on this matter. Uh, I'm only going to recommend that we tell everybody, we tell the world, no, we've got jurisdiction. But I'm going to have Thomas A. Varlin do that because I don't have the foundational support right now for me to feel comfortable doing that myself. Otherwise, he would have. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in this game as Thomas A. Varlin now has the ball and Heather continues to shine her light and duly reject all of these for cause without dishonor. Well, if you've got any love lighter links for me, please send them to lunacy, L-U-N-A-S-E-E -E, at protonmail.com. Thank you so much for all of the wonderful messages, just people checking in on me. It's been a while since I put a video up, but there, there really hasn't been that much to talk about. Uh, I really, I feel the energy and the flow when I'm reading through transcripts. When I'm reading through just legal ease and reports, so much of that energy has been stripped out. And uh, it's pretty plain and evident to see exactly where the courts stand right now. But this is basically uh, them taking their month time limit on responding to the price of pay and basically after that month period saying, no, we still see the same thing, but we're calling a timeout because it's not going to be C. Clifford that makes the decision. If he did make the decision, this would, this would be his decision, but he's only going to offer this as a recommendation to Thomas Varlin. So... Very, very interesting that the courts are just not coming right out and pushing through. They, they are confused as well. So the only thing that I find that we can really do going forward is to hold a high vibration and, you know, let's, uh, let's all do the grand invocation. I say it every night at midnight. <clears throat> and you can go out onto the World Wide Web and find your own version. There, there's a couple different edits of the Grand Invocation. But basically, in a nutshell, it's asking and affirming that deep within the mind of God, 
within the mind of grace, let the light, the ideas, shine forth into the minds of all beings. And deep within the heart of grace, let love spread forth into the hearts of all beings. That's the basic gist of it. It goes a little deeper. But I say it every night at midnight. And I've got a circle of close friends in my local geographic area that have joined in with me. And since I've been doing it, it's been about a week now, I've noticed huge changes in my life. They're, they're, they're beyond anything that I've had to roll with uh, up to this date. They're magical changes, they're spiritual changes, and I'm excited to see what's happening next. That's why I've got this uh, crease in my backside from sitting on the edge of my seat. Thank you so much to BZ for keeping me well informed of when these responses and rebuttals are coming out and posted in downloadable forms. Um, I also wanted to mention that, uh, wow, Randy could sure use some postcards and some love and light from people who truly see the dynamics of this situation. Uh, it, I read something on BZ's website. It looks like Randy uh, was the subject of a jailhouse uh, assault, uh, an organized hit. It, the suspicions or the oh, the source of this assault appeared to be from the quote unquote Texas camp as was written on the IUV website. And that the Texas camp refers to uh, the Bushes and the Cheneys uh, as part of the power structure. So I ask that Grace hold Randy in a protective shell of light. He is always safe and he is always at peace, whatever that means in any particular moment. I ask that uh, if you've got some extra time, send them a postcard. All the address uh, and postcard specifications are on the IUV website. And, you know, I think I'll probably get one out this week too. I love you guys a lot. A little bit longer of a video than normal, but uh, I haven't seen you guys in a while. I love you a lot. And we'll be back uh, when we have some more things to talk about. I love you. Bye-bye.